You're listening to a Thames Estuary Partnership podcast celebrating London's famous tidal river. We hope you enjoy it. Hello, I'm Eve Sanders and welcome back to Talk of the Thames. I hope you're all keeping safe and well during this heatwave period. Today we are talking about all things eels, but specifically we are dedicating this episode to the Thames Catchment Community Eels Project. Now the Thames Catchment Community Eels Project is a partnership led by the Thames Rivers Trust with Action for the River Kennet, South East Rivers Trust and Thames 21, who are all working together to aid the long-term survival of the European eel. And I'm very lucky because today I'm joined by these brilliant project partners, so Anna, Mia, Wanda, Jess, Joe, Ollie, thank you very much for joining me today. How are you all? Good, thank you. Thank Thanks you, for yeah. having us. Very good, thanks. Good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think we'll we'll kick start by talking about what the project is and what its aims and objectives are. Uh, Anna, is this a, a, a good one for you to come in on? It's a collaboration working with Trust, Rivers Trust working together and working closely with ZSL and Thames Estuary Partnership to work across the catchment on specific rivers that we're trying to engage communities with their rivers, but also help improve things for the European eel. So we're doing a range of talks and workshops and eel classroom workshops and assemblies, but we're also getting volunteers out and trained up to help us go and spot obstacles, barriers within the river, because once we've identified those, we can have a more strategic approach to practical work in the future to help open up rivers to eels so they can stand more chance of completing their journey up our rivers and finding healthy habitats. Um, The project is funded by the the government's Green Recovery Challenge Fund and being delivered by the the National Lottery Heritage Fund in partnership with Natural England and the Environment Agency. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. So when when did it kick start? So we started the project right at the beginning of December and we'll be running through till next March. So it's quite, quite new. Yeah, it's the new, it's the first round of funding for this Green Recovery Challenge Fund. So we were it was really exciting to be one of the projects that actually got approved and to start delivering the project. So it's quite a lot we're delivering in a short time space, but really exciting to get the funding in and to be able to start this pilot project. But a few of your organisations, you've you've already worked with eels before. Joe, ZSL have done a lot with um, citizen science and, and eels before. Yeah, well, not actually. Originally, it wasn't citizen science. It was um, it was uh, ZSL staff monitoring eel migration, and so it goes back to two thousand and five. We first started on eel. So ZSL, <clears throat> I've got lots of very ely colleagues in ZSL. So in the Institute of Zoology, we have a chap called Adam Piper, who's sort of known nationally, who works with the Environment Agency. Uh, and ZSL, and he specialises in in studying eel migration and putting in and um, identifying the best mitigation options for the impact of barriers, particularly pumping stations, things like that. So that's Adam. I've also got another colleague, Matt Gollock, who chairs the IUCN's Anguillid Eel Specialist Group. So um, what I mean by that is uh, way back, I, I guess, 2007, seven eight, he would have done the original um, <clears throat> red list assessment for the European eel. So he's, and he subsequently managed that process for, for all anguided eels. I think there's sort of 16 species of so of, ang- of anguided eel. And that's uh, essentially a technical assessment which defines the red lists category, you know, whether they're whether they're least concerned or critically endangered as the European eel is. Um, so that work has been done and continues to be done uh, by some of my colleagues. And is that, so that's, that's quite a long time actually, <laughs> 2005, but have, have any of the other organisations been, been working on eels before as well in the lead up to this project? Uh, well, South East Rivers Trust, we've done uh, various fish passage and eel passage projects um, along our rivers to make barriers uh, like weirs and um, aging stations and things like that more um, eel and fish friendly but in terms of monitoring this is our our first foray into elbow migration monitoring and it's been really exciting. 
Yeah, it's the same at Action for the River Kennet. We haven't done any monitoring or citizen science to do with eels before, um, but we did run projects um, with eels in schools. Um, so the children had their little glass eels and they grew them and then they were released into the river. So through that, they learned all about eels. Um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> um, very similar story for Thames 21. Um, I think after th this, this is why it's so exciting to be kind of just focused on eels. It's often been kind of wrapped into other restoration jobs, river restoration jobs. So um, this is like the first time we've had dedicated staff. So, so what is it about you know why are eels such a such a special species, and and why are you why did you put this project together? Uh, the project was put together. We were building a project around eels before the Green Recovery Challenge Fund opportunity came up, and then so we'd already started working together with the partners and the collaborators to develop something specifically around eels. They're critically endangered, and they're a keystone species, and we thought we could get obviously bigger wins by working together and then when the green recovery challenge fund opportunity came up we were able to tailor our project that was being developed to hopefully be successful which it was with doing this project so they're a really important species they're a fascinating species of fish and there, it's important that we try and we're not owned by although the eel is the kind of iconic species at the heart of this project when practical work happens in the second stage there will then be benefits for many other species too within the river so I, I get you say they're an iconic species and of course they are I think when I think of eels I even think of jelly eels or I think of their amazing migration uh pattern and and is that why you know, why do they come to the Thames or why do they come into our to our rivers in Europe? Everyone else stayed on mute. So is that <laughs> is that is this my turn? Take it Can away. I, uh, why do eels come to the Thames? The, the big question. Um, well, they, they come to all rivers across. So their range is all the way from sort of Scandinavian countries down to North Africa. And they have all anguillid eel species have this amazing oceanic migration. They start life in the sea and they end up in freshwater, although we don't know what proportion of the population actually go into freshwater. So it's clear that some of them remain in brackish water and in shallow marine environments. But it's, it's a sort of exaggerated version of a not uncommon life strategy of many fish species that move into estuaries. Uh, as juveniles for the safety of shallow water away from predators, for warmth, uh, so war warm water, higher temperatures, uh, foster or support uh, faster growth, more food availability in shallow coastal waters and up into rivers. So it's a kind of exaggerated version of what other migratory fish species do. And even sort of fish species that we don't consider migratory, for instance, like a flounder would end up going up into fresh water and then come out uh, into the ocean to, to mature. So that's what's going on for the eel. So it's a, it's a similar pattern to, to fish then, the, with, with, with just coming in for the shelter and the nursery habitats, the safety that an estuary provides, I suppose. Yeah, yeah, we can think of it as an exaggerated but, but familiar life trait for fish, many fish species. And we, a, a few of you have mentioned already that the eel is critically endangered. Why is that? A lot of different reasons for that. So as Joe said, their migration is hugely exaggerated. And so it's 6,000 kilometres from where they're, you know, the larvae start off to when they um, enter our rivers in Europe. So they come all the way from the, the kind of Caribbean Sargasso Sea area, all the way across the Atlantic. And there's obviously a lot that can go wrong <laughs> in that um, in that journey, which takes like one to two years. And uh, problems like climate change, not only, well, they, it affects everything, including the eel, um, because it disrupts those ocean currents that um, the eels, the kind of baby eels, if you like, are, are reliant on to carry them back to Europe. And then once they get here, <laughs> there's lots and lots of problems for them as well. So um, we've talked a lot about barriers. So they're basically huge uh, obstacles for the eels that they just can't get over and make use of that kind of safe nursery habitat um, further up the river. Um, and also they're the most trafficked animal on earth so there's lots of illegal fishing of, of uh, glass eels that they come into estuaries and things like that so it's it's a tough old life being an eel. <laughs> I, I 
I'm presuming it's got tougher with increased pressure as well uh, with, with for, for reasons such as climate change and perhaps overfishing. Um, yeah, so yeah, since the, the between the 60s and 80s, it's really the populations of eels, uh, European eels have really sharply declined in our rivers. They've almost like fallen off a cliff. Um, and yeah, that's just a, an accumulation of all the, the different pressures, I guess. And they were obviously so abundant back in the day. You mentioned uh, like jelly deals and things like that. They were a huge part of um, the culture of the UK. And, and now they're, they're very, very scarce indeed. It's, it's, it's quite, quite a sad story. just crossed my mind that we haven't talked about the eel life cycle and I think that might be quite important because you mentioned glass eels but I think a lot of people won't know what what a glass eel is. When the eggs hatch out in the Sargasso Sea they then develop into these teeny little leptocephalus or leptocephali and start drifting on the current and during that journey across to our the, the ocean across to our freshwater rivers as they're approaching the estuary is when they will develop into little glass eels which is when they then go from being little flat leptocephalus into little long transparent glass eels where you can see their spine and they've got very basic eyes they then develop into elvers so they start they're no longer transparent they're a kind of grayish brown color and you can see fins and the eyes have developed a little bit more and they start to go on what's called the elver run and the ones that come in are going to come in to the thames and carry on up to some of the tributaries of the thames um, will then start on mass moving up at night up the rivers trying to find the healthy habitats and so if they've managed to make it across that epic journey they've then like say they've got the problem the other problems and then those that actually do manage to make it up to a healthy habitat are then going to develop into another life cycle stage which is the yellow eel which is the stage that it spends the majority of its life being and if it's a female this life will be quite a long life in our rivers sort of 20 plus years whereas if it's a male it will be a much shorter time of maybe around seven years before the journey to go into the final life cycle stage of becoming a silver eel on that journey all the way back to the Sargasso Sea with the ultimate aim of spawning to create the next generation of eels but developing into the silver eel doesn't properly happen until they're on that journey back. So there's lots of different life cycle stages when it looks like a very different creature so but it is it's when we're working with the communities and particularly schools we're trying to get across this is one eel but just looking very different throughout its life. You mentioned that the females will be perhaps in in those estuaries or rivers for 20 plus years I didn't know I mean how long does an eel live for? Joe, do you want to get come in on that because it's it is a varied is it a bit unknown and a bit varied with it's very with... variable there's i mean there were a couple of eels in an, in an aquarium in france that were known to be i think over 80 years or a single eel single eel over 80 years old so it depends you know it depends on their environment so uh, typically the sort of warmer rivers of the iberian peninsula in their range or down into north africa they're very fast growing and it's just a few years five six years as you walk, as you go up into the colder northern regions, they can spend a lot longer in rivers, thirty years or so. And uh, the females mature at about a meter in length. The males about forty centimeters. And the females can be sort of big, heavy animals before they start to migrate back out. Wow! I mean, that's that's really that's quite quite amazing, isn't it? That I mean, you, like you said, you, they start off so small and they make that enormous journey yet they, they potentially can live to such an age is uh, pretty mind-blowing, actually. Um, so just to add on to um, the comments made about their life cycle and the kind of le the length of their life and how long they can live for, um, because they only spawn once in their life, kind of at the end when they've made that journey back to the Sargasso Sea, that's kind of partly one of the reasons why we need to act quite quickly now about sort of you know, making sure that we improve habitat and you know we kind of keep populations as high as possible for the eels because the kind of next generation could be in the next 30 years so in 30, what we do now has an impact on the eels that will arrive here in decades to come and because of their they have kind of almost a human generational kind of length then that means it's sort of it's 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 affecting quite far in the future the work that we do now
okay so going back to the to the to the project the Thames Community Eels project what's happened uh, what's the work to date on that? Um, so the work to date has we've had um, project officers from the three the partner trusts who are active on the ground action for the River Kennet South East Rivers Trust and Thames 21 have been out delivering community outreach so doing riverbank walks with an eel theme doing community talks and also out doing work with primary school, engaging and exciting children about this amazing fish that lives in their local rivers. And we want there to be you know, healthy rivers so that the eel can hang on and hopefully do more than hang on, actually improve it living in those rivers. There's also South East Rivers Trust have been working with ZSL through this project to monitor an eel trap. So as those elvers are coming up the river, the volunteers have been trained and are measuring and noting information down about the eels, which Jess and Joe could probably talk more about on getting more data in. And we're busy at the moment trying to recruit volunteers to become part of the obstacle eels element of this project, of which um, Thames Estuary Partnership are playing a big role in this work because everything that the data that we gather with volunteers, either ground truthing existing barrier data, and by barriers we mean things like sluices and weirs, things that prevent the eels from getting further up the river. Uh, it, all this data is being validated, and new barriers, if they're spotted, they're getting input into the fish migration roadmap and this will be the platform on which that data can be interrogated and we can look where would be the best places to do future practical river restoration eel passes or eel weir removals to make life for the eels better so that's kind of where we are at the moment so we're really looking for people who are by the river ravensbourne the upper brent the middle and lower kennet the pang and the mole to get in touch and be trained and then go out in small teams to start logging with our river obstacle app the barriers uh, walking specific stretches so it's a great thing to do to really help us get some robust data get out walking by the river banks get closer to nature and help us plan projects in the future brilliant that sounds really good and a, a really good opportunity to get to get involved in. Um, we'll talk a bit more about the citizen science side of things in a bit, but I'm keen to go back to, to talking about mapping of the barriers. Wanda, you're probably a good person to, to talk on this. Um, so, you're, so you're essentially mapping the barriers that, that could prevent that eels from migrating uh, further up the rivers. Yes, that's correct. So at Thames Estuary Partnership, uh, we, we've been working on the Fish Migration Roadmap project and the idea behind it is that we look at rivers as uh, interconnected roads. So as you would uh, try to cross uh, along the road or even try to exchange at bank could be a good, good uh, so even trying to change at bank could, could become uh, quite uh, not easy for, for, for you to change. So similarly for eels, the same, same can happen in rivers with having these barriers. And the idea is that we gathered, so we have data already, but some of this data is not uh, grand truth. So with the Citizen Science Project, we collect all this data using the River Obstacle app, which was redeveloped uh, specifically to go out and 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 map and map these barriers, um, and we you, you, we utilize this for this project as well. And then the data then collected will be part of the roadmap, and then further on, uh, strategically, people can use it, developers, stakeholders, etc., so that they can gradually open up. Uh, areas, especially priority areas. So for example, those river sections, which has uh, high or diverse habitat quality for, for these uh, fish species, especially for, for eels. Brilliant. That sounds like really, really important work. Can I pick up on a point that um, Ollie was making? Because I think it's Please critical. Do. Is that all right? So discussion around you know what, what the priority is in freshwater and why what we're doing now through the, this project and other projects on the Thames um, with it to conserve eel. Um, 
the focus is about opening habitat, so making passable passes, sorry, not making passes barriers, making barriers passable um, to open up as much habitat as possible for eels so that as many eels as possible can grow within the habitat of the Thames and then migrate back to the Sargasso to spawn and release the next generation. So I suppose fundamentally that's what this project is about. It's about supporting growing populations in the future. And also just to just to sort of um, the, the the detail of the decline, the first the first observations around the decline of eel were noted by um, monitoring projects as we have within this project. So um, uh, CERT uh, and, and ZSL are monitoring a site on the mole, and that's one of a number of sites around the Thames. We're using a method, a monitoring method that goes back 15 years or so. And in the early days of that monitoring, we saw that our data, so from 2005 to 2010, our data was 90, on the river roading, this is, was 98% lower than using the same traps at the same site in the river roading that were, that were deployed in the 1980s. Uh, so that direct comparison when we were gathering that data, others in Europe were seeing the same problem. And that's why there was more research into real and so the alarm bells were raised and that's why they then become assessed through the IUCN red listing method and they become designated as critically endangered. So it's so important that that kind of monitoring carries on because how do we know if we're successful or not without understanding whether the population is expanding or declining? And for that, we need the Rivers Trusts and citizen scientists and gathering all the good data that they're getting. Does that also mean that you have to uh, work with people on, on a sort of both national and international scale then to, to look at other populations in the, in the broader sense? Yeah, absolutely. It's critical. You know, it's a, as Jess was saying, um, you know, it's got a very big convoluted uh, life cycle, this fish, and it's in, in, imperative that uh, there's international collaboration. And that's what my colleague who I mentioned earlier, who works for the IUCN or chairs the IUCN and Gwilid Eel Specialist Group, that's what they do. They try to create, uh, bring partners together across Europe. And in fact, that's actually instilled in, in European law now since 2009 there was eu regulations around supporting um uh, conservation action for eel and what that meant was that um each member state i know we're talking about europe and we have sadly left um uh, but uh or the political union we've left um each member state had to produce a conservation management plan for eel and um the UK has one and it's broken down into different regions and there's a Thames eel management plan and all this work, uh, the good work of the, uh, of the um, Thames eel community project uh, uh, ties in with the ambitions of the wider eel management plan for the region. And that's about identifying barriers, opening up migratory routes, opening up access to more habitats. Those are all essentials, essential actions within the wider plan for eel. So really vital work then, really vital work. Ultimately, what's the ultimate goal for the Thames? Would that lead to, to more habitat restoration? And um, I mean, because the, the Thames is, as, as we all know, it's I think it's a third of its original size, and I'm sure that's that's played a part in, in the decrease in numbers, but would it would ultimately it lead to a lot more habitat restoration around the Thames? I think we'd we'd hope so. <laughs> um, so yeah, as you say, wetland habitats especially have been, you know, lost across across the country, not just in the Thames catchment, and um, they're vital areas for eels um, as well as lots of other species. So um, not only are we hoping that we'll be able to re remove those barriers so that um, eels can move further upstream, but also create and restore um, new wetland and freshwater habitats once they get there <laughs> so that there's you know high quality um habitat that's not got lots of pollution and all that kind of stuff that could be um harming the eels that managed to make it this far so that yeah protecting them so until they can 
migrate all the way back across the sea. <laughs> and But it won't just be beneficial for, for eels. I mean, there's so many other species, I guess, that could benefit from a um, more joined up approach to, to restoration. I think it's, Joe, this, you probably correct me if I'm wrong, but the smelt um, is another species that's suffering quite dramatically under habitat habitat loss or that uh, loss of feeding and nursery grounds. Yeah, man, we've lost so many iconic species because of the barriers, you know, we're, we're uh, sturgeon, for instance, you know, um, they used to be relatively common in our estuaries and rivers and they're gone. And one of the main reasons is because we haven't, we didn't have Wanda and her roadmap project, uh, you know, identifying barriers and making sure we do something about it. And actually what's really heartening is that over the last, I don't know, 20 years or so, we've really realised this is an issue. We've realised it quite late because our all our rivers, you know, in the Thames area alone, there's an estimated 20,000 or so structures obstructing fish migration. And, and there's a lot of work afoot. You know, the Environment Agency are leading the charge, but all the rivers trusts, getting rid of barriers where they're not needed or if it's if you can't get rid of a barrier then you you mitigate its impact by putting in a fish pass or an eel pass and that the longer that work goes on I think the more we'll start to see the recovery of these maybe even sturgeon coming back into the Thames how wonderful would that be um yeah can I can I add on to that um yeah just a, just another thing in terms of improving habitat for all sorts of different species um this is going to be a really cheesy way of linking it in, but also um, the human species uh, would be improved by improved habitat. So if I think about like the river Ravensbourne where I'm working, so there's sections of the river which are really just a big, you know, glorified concrete drain and it's sort of not very good habitat for, for many species. The sections which you go, this is lovely, are often in parks and areas where like the community can actually access the river. So it's sort of, it, it, goes hand in hand and I think that's sort of at the heart of what a lot of us what a lot of the rivers trusts want is that kind of joined up approach is that you can kind of go oh I can now see the river and it's lovely and it's also available habitat for loads of different species. It's looking at it through through a more holistic lens I suppose is kind of key or and it's becoming um, I think more people are becoming aware of how just how important that is over time. Um, okay, thank you for that. That was um, a really interesting to kind of paint the broader picture. But moving on to next steps and legacy for the project, what are you hoping to, this project, will, will it continue or um, what are you hoping to leave behind? So we're hoping to have gathered lots of information, but not lots of information that isn't used, information that helps us and other groups and organisations go out and make really good judgments on where to do practical restoration for eels and as we said with knock-on benefits for a whole host of other forms of wildlife native species um, and during the project there will be time for us to start planning those the next projects once we've got that data in and then that will enable us to be ready to put in another application and possibly work with you know more project partners and because this is very much a pilot project look at what has worked what hasn't worked and how we can improve that and go forward with a, a bigger stronger project but with where this one has done lots of gathering of information where the next step the legacy would be putting that information to make some practical differences for the eel and along that journey with this project and the next project making sure we get communities involved and connecting with their rivers and enjoying and understanding their rivers and lots of people might not know they've got this not particularly cute and cuddly but really important and fascinating fish that's living in their rivers and I think most people are quite impressed when they find out about its life cycle and we want people to kind of know about that and be excited about that and, in, and enjoy their rivers and, and help us with the rivers too whether it's doing the obstacles or at the next stage being in the river helping with habitat restoration and so on. I, I'd contest that. I, I think elvers are, are very, very cute. Uh, I, in the, in the, I <laughs> eels, but I just know that's not everybody. Kind of, <laughs> 
take on them. I think they are cute in their own way, just not conventionally so. At yeah. the end of the project, it will be everyone, Anna. You will have convinced everyone in the terms that they are magnificent, wonderful it. and fantastic, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, some of our Elva migration monitoring volunteers were not keen on eels to start with, but they were deliberately like, this is important work. I'll, 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 you know, persevere with the eels. And then they, when they actually saw them close up, they now love them. So it was a success story on that front. <laughs> yeah, that's good. It, it's funny because they are quite snake-like, I suppose. So if you, if you're, if people are afraid of snakes, then they might not like to get too close. But they're, they're absolutely stunning creatures. We found a few on the fish surveys at the Estuary Edges sites, and they're, they're gorgeous, they're stunning. Slimy, but stunning. <laughs> and you say they're not cute, but I think you've made a, a good start with convincing people with the logo of the eel with the glasses, and has it got a flip phone as well? <laughs> that sold me. Funny. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so um, last, but certainly not least, uh, a call for volunteers. How can people get involved with this amazing work? How, how can they um, get in contact with you? Um, there's several ways people can get in touch. They can visit the Thames Rivers Trust website and go on the contact button there. And we can put you in touch with the most appropriate trust, whichever trust you're nearest. Or if you know which river you're closest to, if it's the Kennet or the Pang, you need to go on the Action for the River Kennet website and get in touch with Mia. South East Rivers Trust website has got a page about obstacles and there's a link there to get in touch with Jess or for Thames 21 on the Upper Brent or the Ravensbourne, go on the Thames 21 website and email. Ollie's details are on the page about the project there. So lots of ways to kind of get in touch and training is happening I think there's a training session happening in the next few days uh, but there's more training happening over the coming weeks it's a two-step training process but it's really worth doing and then getting out and helping us and we've had some great feedback from people who have taken part in the training and are already out mapping or logging those obstacles for us and also if you're a, a teacher in any of those catchments we can come and deliver free uh, assemblies or um, sessions with your um, primary school age uh, pupils so get in touch we're ready and raring to teach you all about yours <laughs> and we've got some excellent resources that each child that takes part gets we've got an eel comic and we've got an eel fact sheet and every child that takes part in the project gets a lovely copy of those and on the website on the Thames Rivers Trust website there's lots of different Ely resources that people of any age can go on and have a look at as well. Well I'll definitely be checking them out. An eel comic did you say? Yes. Yeah, Brilliant. <laughs> and coming soon there's going to be an eel online game again suitable for any ages so you you start off as an egg and you've got to hatch out and, and make it a, on that epic journey so that will be being launched very soon hopefully. Exciting. Uh, thank you everyone for joining me today and uh, best of luck with the project. Thanks very much. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you so much for joining us for this episode of Talk of the Thames. I had a really great time talking to everyone today and getting to know more about this amazing project. If you would like to find out more, please visit Thames Community Eels Project webpage at www.thamesriverstrust.org.uk forward slash Thames Catchment Community Eels Project. I'll be back next month for a brand new episode, but until then, enjoy the summer, take care and bye-bye. <laughs>